everyone always asks me to do this one on stream. Um, Amazing. <laughs> so good. Come on, we should give a clap for that. <laughs> <laughs> So, wait, what's that? Is that Kill Bill? Is it? That? Yeah. yeah, yeah, where she's walking down the corridor. The Twisted Nerve song. Okay, so obviously, uh, Anita, we've met before, but for any new viewers or listeners, would you mind describing who you are? I'm Sweet Anita, and I'm kind of an online something. I don't exactly know <laughs> how else to describe it. I make content, content creator. Let's go with content creator. Yes, on YouTube and Twitch primarily, mainly live stream content. And I aim to accidentally teach people stuff by passively making them laugh. I think that's my approach. So the first thing I wanted to ask you before we sort of get into the story of your career mm -hmm. is I've never interviewed someone with Tourette's before. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what the etiquette is for mm -hmm. tics. Is it polite to just ignore them or to reference them? Or, you know, what, what is the, educate me a bit on that. It depends on the person. Sure. So like there is no etiquette for Tourette's. There's only etiquette for the person because everyone's condition affects them differently. Mm. Like you might meet someone and not even know they have Tourette's because they only have one or two mild tics that are very quiet. And then you might see, meet someone who has like constant explosive episodes of tics. Mm. And, you know, people have different tolerances of like what they can handle. And I know some people with Tourette's who are really, really sensitive to um, laughter and just don't like to be laughed at because they're, you know, it takes can be painful and mm. it can be really challenging to navigate them. And I really don't care. For me personally, like, I grew up being punished for my tics because I wasn't diagnosed as a kid. Mm. So everyone just thought I was misbehaving. So if I know that people find it funny or that they don't care, then I know that they're not mad at me. So if anything, laughter is reassuring compared to how people used to react to me. And so I don't mind if people laugh. I, w I don't mind if people want to ignore it. Um, I don't mind if people want to joke about it. Like I have friends, I have a tick where I'll go fingers in you. And um, most people are just like kind of taken aback, but my friends will go, yeah, sure. And I'll go 10 and I'll start haggling. And they know that if they agree with it and go, hmm, yeah, maybe a bit more, like I'll keep on ticking. So, and people walking by give us looks every time and they don't care. So I, I have interactions like that with my friends cause they kind of know the boundary and you know, I kind of feel like for me, I'm not fussed how people react so long as they're comfortable and know that I don't mean it and that I'm not really mm. going to try and fist them. <laughs> Great. And did you mean it when you said Andy had a nice ass? Absolutely. Great. And was the Tourette's present from birth or did it suddenly ramp up and start to become more visible at some point? This really interests me because obviously I can't know for sure. Most mm. of us don't remember birth. Um, and uh, sure. you don't know any words when you're a, you're a baby. Mm. So like, it's not going to be easy to know the difference between a twitch and just a baby wiggle. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like I, I shot out of the womb and was just like, fuck off to like <laughs> everyone in the delivery room. So uh, how can you really tell? A lot of people say that they suddenly had like a tick that came on somewhere around eight, nine, 10. That's quite a common age for Tourette's to start. Mm. Although it can start in adulthood. It can start because of medication. It can start because of... Um, trauma or head injuries. Um, and the thing with this is, is my mom said my first word was Michael Schusmacher. <laughs> wow, okay. And she like that really confused my mom and dad because they were hoping for <laughs> mom or dad. They, they were competing <laughs> over that. Um, and that, once I said it once, I would not stop. And then for many years after I developed a vocabulary... I was still saying it out of the Michael blue. Michael Schusmacher. Yes. Um, and that, when I when I talked about this, I brought my mom on my stream and asked her about this. And um, all of the Formula One fans love me now. <laughs> um, but the thing with that was, is I don't know if I ha my first word was a tick yeah. or if I had Tourette's since birth or that I had a later onset and that was just like my first word. I don't know for sure, but it seems like my first word was a tick. Mm. And yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's an impressive years. first word. Yes, exactly. My daughter's was like cat or something. Yeah. Michael Schumacher. 
Yeah, I, I wonder if I was particularly just a quiet and observant child um, other than the ticks, and perhaps I had the capacity to speak before or understand words before I spoke because I was quite quiet and non-talkative mm. for a lot of my childhood. I recently looked at my medical records and um, as far back as you go, it, intermittently it says neglect, bad parenting, quiet, mm. um, kind of flat, um, emotionally flat. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very different to how I was in my childhood and teens. Mm. Um, so I wonder if the reason why I had such a complex first word was because I knew how, like words and things. I just wasn't trying to communicate. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Time. That's interesting. And when you, when you're saying that your childhood was never stable, so to speak, did you ever start going to school consistently or were you kind of in and out of school? In and out. So I would try for like maybe a year tops and mm. then drop for a long period of time. I was mostly home educated and weirdly I was I was teaching myself. My mom would just go, here's all my university books and <laughs> push in about 10 year old and just be like, good luck, teach me something later. And then she'd give me like books with lines in to write and just her like geology books and science books and things like that. And I'd go through them, I'd read them, I'd write notes down, I'd research them. And, you know, my mum had loads and loads of books at that point because she was studying. So, and then at the end of the day, she'd be like, what did you find out? And I'd go, well, and I'm like, even though that seems really lazy, it was great because I was learning how to teach myself, mm -hmm. take an interest and take notes. I was tailoring my learning to a way that I can retain it personally, which works so much better than school because I have ADHD. Most, right. Like most people with Tourette's have lots of other diagnosis. Right. And um, so I was doing ADHD friendly learning without realizing. And um, when you re-explain something to someone, you change the way that your brain has stored the information. Oh. So And so it's easier to remember and learn things if you then pass on that knowledge and teach someone else. So unconsciously, she was teaching me in the best possible way. And I became very advanced in these particular topics. I have like, when I go to schools, I have stacks and stacks of like awards for uh, like maths, science, mm. English, all, so, you know, all these sorts of things. I did instantly well, even though I wasn't following the curriculum mm. at all. For time. So you were kind of naturally academic, though, in that sense. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of lucky that I didn't go into the sciences because I wanted to, when I was 10, I wanted to get men pregnant and bioengineer a mind-controlling parasite that would make people more peaceful. So I probably am then, glad that I yes, dropped I'm, out. Yes, I'm also glad you didn't yeah. <laughs> go into sciences. Who knows what would have happened? Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> I mean, good ambitions, though. Uh, so... So what were you like as a child at that point? Like, did you have a friendship group or a couple of close friends or any friends? No, uh, I liked animals. Animals mm. don't care if you call them a slut. So mm -hmm. um, I had, I was always taking in animals. You were talking in the description there of kind of how you dealt with in your younger life, how you dealt with the ticks. You mentioned mm -hmm. college and university. So you'd sort of managed to stay in education. Is that right? You'd sort of gone to high school, then to college and then to university. I kind of skipped high school. I, right. I, I think I went to like a few months here and there across a few middle schools and primary schools. Nothing really much to speak of. A year at a high school-ish thing. And then after that, uh, I think like three or four years of isolation and then wow. suddenly college and that was a lot because I was agoraphobic and I was just like fuck it I don't want to live just staring at the same four walls I'm gonna try and I was just like having panic attacks and coming home crying just like oh after like being there for like five minutes and I just kept going and being like ah, I lasted 10 minutes today ah, yeah. I lasted like an hour and I just like kind of forced my way back into the world and it was horrible because like I chose um I chose games design which was a mistake because games design is full of horny maladapted boys and it <laughs> sure. didn't change like games design is like had so many scandals those those boys grew up that I was studying <laughs> okay. with and they're just still just as messed up and then so I left that and went into animation which was 40 boys and me but they were nice boys right so uh gained all the same skills just with fewer dicks to bat away mm -hmm. and um yeah, that was that was great. I mean, I got in by virtue of just going, I have this folder full of drawings. Will you take me? Because uh, I've heard there's this thing called a student loan and I'm hungry. That was just kind of like the mentality. I would have gone into science. I was really passionate about science, but I didn't have any GCSEs or A-levels or anything to show that I had any capacity. Oh, wow. So instead of those, you were accepted on the course by your folder of 
of drawings. Pictures, yeah, drawings, yeah, wow. Basically, and um, they were like, normally we wouldn't do this, but um, unfortunately, my on my course, a lot of the people who wanted to be animators didn't have very many drawing skills and things. And he was like, in order to get the funding for this course, I need to be able to show off like what's happening in this course because mm. it's relatively new. So having people with drawing skills will really help me to sell the course. Mm. So if you take your A-levels alongside the course, we'll arrange all of that for you. Just make sure you pass them. And then I got my student loans and that was how I managed to get food and stuff because I just couldn't get employed. Like I would try to get jobs, but like, I throw things if I hold them for too long as a tick and, you know, I'm constantly insulting people and stuff. There's just no way you could, like, if I tried to stack shelves, someone's going to get knocked out. With right. That. So and Yes. And I suppose at that point in your life as well, you don't have a diagnosis to be able to say, I've got this, by the way, in case this happens. So you, yeah. you, you were aware that if you went and started stacking shelves, you'd end up throwing whatever you were holding. Mm -hmm. So so the three or four years that you said in, that were in isolation, they were directly after school, is that right? Yeah, I had a bad incident at the last school and was like, fuck it, there's no point trying to get an education if you're not going to survive the education part. Um, do, you want, do you want me asking what the incident was or is it private? Yeah, it's fine. I um, There were, I used to get myself in trouble a lot with other students um, and I would do things like, there were kids who would just try to start rumors and things like this and they'd say, I've heard you take drugs. And I'd be like, yep, drugs. And they'd be like, see, she's admitting it. Mm. admitting it because like the tick would say the most inappropriate thing at the time or the thing that would get me the most in trouble at the time. And unfortunately that meant that, yeah, I used to get in accidental conflicts a lot. And um, I had other trouble as well. <laughs> I used to beat up a lot of boys um, because I had... I was an early bloomer, which was another problem. Not only did I have like a condition which makes me shout random words mm. at people, I also had massive tits. I was like okay. a double D at 10. I'm not even exaggerating. Okay. So this is a problem at school. Yeah. And so I had a three warning system. The first is a don't touch me. And if they kept on doing it, I'd be like, I'm going to have to hurt you. And if they kept on doing it, I was like, okay, what is about to happen is your fault. And like I broke one kid's arm, another kid's arm and leg. I got up on a table and kicked another kid in the face and these sorts of things. Like, I mean, these all sound reasonable. Yeah. Those, after those after three warnings. Yeah, three, three warning system. And because uh, I read a lot of philosophy books and had a strong sense of ethics. At okay. That age. Um, but just going back to, I suppose, the uh, the linear nature of your life. So you were now at, um, you're now at university. You've managed to find a course which you like, the uh, games design. Is it? No, the games design was a bad one. The mm -hmm. animation one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how was that going? Well, I... Um, didn't do any animating after I left. Um, I actually uh, was in an abusive relationship towards the end of my university studies. Mm. So I was studying for a higher degree, but didn't finish that. I got my degree, but not my higher degree. Um, ended up having to uproot, uproot my life and move in order to escape him. Because he'd already tried to kill me once, and he was, he'd was he killed my cat. And he'd... Wow, which, this... <laughs> A lot's just happened in the last 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you were, sorry, I don't mean to laugh. Obviously, it's not it's funny. Fine, it's just it's kind fine. of like, um, so you, you, so university was going okay, but you got into an abusive relationship with, obviously, if there's anything that you don't want to talk about that's too private, that's, please let me know. But you got into an abusive relationship with somebody who, was that a fellow student or somebody that was older than you or? I was a fellow student. A fellow student. Mm -hmm. And um, they tried to kill you already? Yeah, so uh, I think I was in my, I think I was like 20-ish, maybe. Um, and yeah, he he. I was with him for a very long time, but he suddenly flipped. Like he was such a gentle person. Um, and he was kind of nerdy and quiet. And he was the kind of person who'd dunk his coat in a river just to help fish a bug out. He was right. the kind of person who was very... Like, no one would think you would hurt a fly. And I think I, I got a sense of security from that because mm. after everything I went through in my childhood, I was really looking for someone gentle. Yeah. And um, after a few years, he just flipped. And he went from somebody who was very safe to someone who was very dangerous. And I don't know, it's hard because it all happened around the time that my mom... So we moved into a place, our landlord died, and the ownership of the house was like being debated by his children and we were going to be have to look for a new place and we'd taken on loads of rescue animals that we couldn't 
take with us because mm. nowhere would let us bring pets. Mm -hmm. um, so we were kind of stuck. And I was like, I don't want to end up on the streets again. Um, my mom's really vulnerable and these animals are just going to have to go to a, a shelter and all the local shelters are kill shelters. Mm. Um, so my ex was like, because I just recently broke up with him and he was like, um, is, this, uh, is he exhibiting dangerous behaviors at the moment after you broke up with him or not yet? Not yet, not no. Yet. Like, we just fell out and okay. I was just not interested. And then um, he came back and he was like, I know what's happening to you. I've got an inheritance. I can buy the house. I can save you. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I need a place to live. If I can live downstairs, um, then, you know, I can get all this worked out. I just want to help you. And I was like, okay. And he lived in the flat underneath us. It was a house broken up into two. And um, he... Because my mom was so grateful, she was like, you know, the door's always open if you want a cup of tea, if you mm. want to hang out, all this sort of stuff. And um, so he'd come up into our flat and he would, you know, just hang out. And he just got more and more aggressive, more and more disrespectful. And he just began to pressure me and he was horrible. Um, and he was like, what are you going to do about it? Your life's ruined. Like, you're homeless without me sort of thing. And Oh, my God. The thing is, I can't tell because his family had, like, sudden onset mental health problems, mm. like a, a lot of his family were like fine and normal. And then one day a, flick, a, a switch flicked and they'd have a mental breakdown and they'd have to be institutionalized, seem to run in the family. And I don't know whether it was that or that he's like a lot of domestic abusers where they slowly build into the violence after taking away your support network, mm. after making sure that you're financially reliant, after making sure that, you know, nobody believes you, after making you look crazy to your friends, mm. these sorts of things. Because a lot of people don't know this about domestic violence, but... It's not that people just love being abused. That's a stereotype about women. Oh, they're like a bad boy. They mm. always skim over the nice guys and go for someone mm. who treats them like shit. And it's not true. It's that all the people that do these terrible things lie. So they, every person looks like a decent person until they get the opportunity to hurt you and get away with it. And so a lot of them build into it. They start picking fights with your family. So you've got no support network. Mm. They start... You know, make I you know isolating you from your friends. They start controlling your food and making you hungry and tired, arguing with you long into the night until you've just lost all sense of time and space. And so you're confused and tired and weak. And it's then that they'll hit you, and then they'll say that you imagined it or mm. that you deserved it. Gaslighting. Gaslighting. And so they build into the violence, and people don't see that. They just see their friend, who you know just get with this douchebag and you can see it from the outside really easily and you just don't see how they make it invisible from the inside mm. at all. Okay, and then so, uh, and he killed your cat as well? He did. Um, but how, like, how? I still don't know. I just know that um, he used to come in for a specific window. We'd always leave it open for the cat. Then one day he stopped coming home and the exact same day um, he started closing the window and I'd open uh, it again. So he already knew the cat wasn't coming oh back. God. And then one day I went down um, after he, like I, I moved out in a hurry. I used a domestic violence um, organization to get away. Right. Um, and in that situation, I had to quickly go down and remove a couple of pieces of furniture he'd taken from me. Um, and he, I pulled the furniture back and there was just fur and blood all up the wall um and it was all his ginger fur and i was like ah okay oh my god so and the thing is like the police are just useless i i tried with the police there's just uh-uh so wow okay and how old are you at this point I was in my early 20s. Early 20s, okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I moved on from that, got a new partner who wasn't that great. He wasn't abusive, but he was not great. He stole eight grand from me, cheated on me. Definitely not great, I would no. say is um, accurate. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so that that was not great either. But I ended up starting a business and mm. selling things online and became completely self-efficient because... Um, like self-sufficient because I, I, I fuck cats. I basically was, no one was stupid enough to employ me. So mm. I just had to employ myself. Um, and what were you selling? So I started off with sea glass, um, which is kind of these pebbles made of glass. You know, when you throw trash out, mm -hmm. um, if any glass ends up in the sea, it'll get eroded like a pebble. Oh yes, I know what you mean. Like soft, kind of opaque. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it ends up frosted on the surface. Yes. And some of them are like hundreds of years old and mm. like some of them make 
you know, people make jewelry out of them, but they can also be worth quite a lot of money. Mm. And uh, I, yeah, I sold that at first because it was free. And I didn't know I could sell it. I just liked finding it. It was very therapeutic. I was going through a processing stage where I was going down to the beach just to get away from looking after my mom and just to have some time with my own thoughts because obviously a lot's happened in my mm -hmm. life. And I just needed some processing time. So I'd just pick it up just because it was fun. And then I found out that other people online were picking it up and that they were trading it, selling it. So I set up a little online shop and I sold Sea Glass. And then I saved up the money and bought craft supplies that I knew were hard to get from my animation degree. And then I sold those and I turned over the money and turned it over again. And eventually I rented a couple of offices and I filled them with dick, I filled them with cat, I filled them with like stock. And then fuck off, I started selling it from there, which was fun because it was- the, a, Was the stock the sea glass or the animation supplies? So the craft supplies at this point? Both at, both at one point and oh, wow. slowly just shifted just to craft supplies. Right. Um, and then, I was in this big office building with two offices adjacent to each other, one for stock, one for posting and stuff. And um, people would walk by to their offices and they'd never meet me, <laughs> but they'd hear me. Um, so I always wonder what they were theorizing my job was. <laughs> right, in there. packaging things up all the time. Yeah, but just hearing me like shout, I fuck cats and stuff oh, I see, right, intermittently. Yeah, sure. you know, I do wonder what they thought I was doing. Um, and the postmen would always warn each other about me which was really amazing. So uh, basically I received a lot of parcels because I had, I had a lot of stuff to sell mm. and I'd order it in. So they'd drop off the parcels and I have a problem with like smacking things out of people's hands. Right. And I also have a spanking tick. So like there was at least a couple of post uh, posties who I'd smack it out of their hands, they'd turn around to pick it up, I'd spank them. And then and I'd be like, I am so sorry. Um, and they'd be like, it's okay, it's okay. And they'd just tell each other, like, you be careful. I wonder what they were saying though. I don't know. But like one time I one knocked on the door and I was like, nice cock. And he was like, oh, I was told about you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Reputation preceded you there. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. I, I quite enjoyed my uh, posty conversations and things. Um, and then I started playing Overwatch. Um, my ex-boyfriend, the bad one. Um, but not so bad. This new boyfriend, he um, sure. he got me into Overwatch, and I kept the Overwatch and dumped the boyfriend. I was like, "This is fun, but you're not." And uh, I was on Overwatch that I found Twitch because a streamer found me. So um, I was doing Twitch as a, like a mild hobby, and it wasn't even. I didn't even know people could make a living off it. I was literally just streaming my games so people could see when there was an opening and join me, and then that was all it was for. It wasn't, it was just a social thing for me. Um, and So at this point, you're essentially, you've become just a self-sufficient person that's doing your um, sales work mm -hmm. and basically doesn't need to talk to anyone except postmen who you spank, right? That's yeah. basically your, your interactions. Um, but just for people who are listening or watching that might not be fully aware, can you just explain firstly what Overwatch is? is oh. and secondly what twitch is i know okay. that seems like an obvious thing but you know we have a very big audience varied ages yeah yeah so basically uh overwatch is an online game you can it's like a first person shooter um you, you are in a team of five or six and then you fight each other and you can have you can communicate with your team um so i had a headset on i'd have a mic and i'd hold down the button to talk and then lift it and you couldn't hear me again Ah, okay. And that meant people met me before my condition, which was right. great. Because the people that did like me, who knew that I had my condition, were annoying. They were like, um, so at this point in, in my life, I was I pretty sure I had Tourette's. I had a very strong suspicion. I'd actually started going to the hospital and asking for tests and things. Um, so I it was suspected Tourette's. And I, so I'd preface it with that. I was like, I have what might be Tourette's. I'm sorry if I say anything weird, I don't mean it. And so they'll be like, oh my God, I love Tourette's. Oh, okay. of like things like Big Brother and stuff. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, can I show you to my friends? They would love that. And oh, would you spank my friend? And I was just like, ugh, and I hated it. So I ended up, um, like the way I coped with it was I'd make online friends on this game and they wouldn't know I had Tourette's because with Push to Talk, I could just lift up my finger and I'm muted. That's so interesting because one of the things that I was going to say was I thought Overwatch was an interesting choice of game for you because of the fact that you've got the team play so you'd be talking over the choice of a game where you didn't have to communicate in that way. Yeah. But it makes complete sense because you had you could control when they could hear you 
speaking or making sounds or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it made it really appealing because people were meeting me before my condition and they were liking me for who I am because when I first started saying it might be Tourette's, I got a lot of acceptance. Mm. Um, They were like, oh, I understand what's going on now. But then they were like over romanticizing it and being Mm. weird. So this gave me an avenue to navigate my condition and have friends. And Mm. I was very talkative and it taught me so many important social skills. Like if anyone's listening who's really lonely and doesn't know how to connect with people, online gaming is such a great way because you have so many throwaway interactions. So if you fuck it up, there are no consequences. Mm. And a lot of people use that to be abusive, but it's really great for practice of (laughs) learning how to make conversation, make small talk. That's interesting. Ease people in. And so I feel like that's when I started being like less socially inept. Was there. And I suppose what you got from the push to talk thing is what most other people have, which is a control over what they say, right? So did that feel like a completely new way of interacting pe- with people or was it kind of like, this is what I've always wanted to be able to do? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It was great. I mean, a lot of my friends there, I so I made a bunch of friends that became my mods when I started Twitch streaming mm-hmm. um, and they didn't know I had Tourette's back then. Um, they thought I was a voice actor for one of the characters because I ended up having a tick and I could replicate her voice. Which one? It was Tracer. Oh, okay. Um, so Tracer's like meant to be this British girl. Yeah. She has like one of those forced Mary Poppins on crack kind of accents that like the Americans think we have. Yeah. Even though we don't. And so it annoyed me and that made it a tick. And so I just kept repeatedly saying it until like it was so spot on that people thought, that I was a voice actor and sometimes I'd troll them. Right. And like sometimes they thought I was a soundboard. Like I played a drinking game quite often on Friday nights where I'd whack out like some vodka or something, pour a shot. And it'd be like every time I get accused of being a soundboard, um, <laughs> I have to take a shot. And so I'd play the game and I'd be like, I would just use whatever voices I could because I have so many that I can do. And I would just like push down the button, say something. And they'd be like, oh, nice sound, dude, bro. I bet you're a fat dude from America. Stop it. Turn off the soundboard, bro. And I'd just be like, oh, no, he's really like, and then say it too often. I'd be like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. But it's interesting you say that about the, um, what you say that about them thinking you've sounded like Tracer because... uh, I remember the first time I saw you online, I can't remember which video it was. It might have even been the Sidemen Tinder one, potentially. Uh-huh. But I remember like I couldn't quite place where I thought you were from. Like I thought you had a slightly American accent. Yeah, um, weirdly, it's a fun fact about Tourette syndrome. Um, a lot of us have like really bad infectious accent. Like we, we pick up um, sounds really easily and mm. accents really easily. And I know this, not because it's well documented, but because I'm in a lot of communities for people with Tourette's syndrome mm-hmm. and like community discords and things. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I pick up accents really fast and I often tick in other accents as well. Like I'll tick and I'll sound really American or really Irish or something out of the blue. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, I have that too. And then there was a stream of like 50 people going, that is exactly me. And I was like, is this a Tourette's thing? Because we're all saying this. Mm. Um, so a lot of us mimic sounds anyway as a tick. Like it's quite often, there's something called echolalia, which is the form of tick where you say back to someone what they just said to you. And it gets you in a lot of trouble because people think you're just being childish. Like, right. You know, if you're like, could you move the chair? You're like, can you move the chair? <laughs> like, so people get really annoyed with it. It's quite a, a, a tough tick to have socially, but it means that from a very young age, you're replicating everything you hear. Mm. Um, I have a... Yeah, this and, sounds so much like the alert. Mm-hmm, and I have a... And like I got, you know, you, you pick up sounds that just never mm. leave you if you hear them repetitively enough. Um, so sometimes I sound more American because I'm surrounded by Americans. I'm on mm. Twitch. Most of Twitch is operated by Americans. Most of the big streamers are American. Most of the people I'm socializing with because of that is American people. So it seeps in. Mm. And then I'll spend like two days in London and sound British again. Right. It's, it's really frustrating. And it's funny you say that about the, the the whistle thing, because we did a video before where we discussed with you about the fact that, I think, am I right in thinking that you've used whistling to, to cover ticks at one point? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I live near a school, so if I walk home at the wrong time... I'll be offering to fist children. Great, um, okay, yeah. So when you know that certain ticks are very, very threatening, you learn strategies, mm. emergency strategies. But a lot of people with Tourette's syndrome don't tick when they're making music. Like that's one of the things that quite universally helps a lot of people with Tourette's syndrome. So because um, you're forced to do this thing in order to not tick, you 
often end up getting very good at something. I know a streamer with Tourette's who's a drummer and he's a fantastic drummer because mm. when he drums, he doesn't tick, so it's a break mm. from his condition. Um, and for me, whistling is a way to, like, I can't just carry a flute or like a banjo with me everywhere I go to <laughs> yeah. just like cope with difficult situations. So whistling is just something I can passively do. Uh, uh, um, after your mom, after dad, after, after um, when, I'm in a, when I'm in a situation where um, I can't escape and I don't want to um, come across as weird, like in an escalator mm -hmm. or like there are situations where I know, like once I went into a bathroom and there were a bunch of black girls stood at the mirror and I kept ticking the N-word over and over again. Oh my God. Cubicle. And I was like, am I going to come out and have an altercation? Because mm. like, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to explain. And, you know, these sorts of situations are really tough. So whistling is a good way to be the weirdo whistling instead of, the, the weirdo offering to fist your grandma. Yes, that's understandable. And and the byproduct you told us before is that you're amazing at whistling. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'd like to think I've gotten good at it. Could you, I, we did this before in a video and it got so many comments where mm. we asked you to give us just a blast of something you're really good at whistling. Can I ask you to do it again? Sure, let me think of a song. Oh, everyone always asks me to do this one on stream. Um... Amazing. <laughs> so good. Come on, we should give a clap for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, what's that? Is that Kill Bill? Is it? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, where she's walking down the corridor. The Twisted Nerve song. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. <laughs> so, um, you'd started playing Overwatch with your ex boyfriend. Had you been into gaming before that, or was that the first time you sort of experienced it? It was my first time online gaming. I loved The Last of Us and um, console games. And whenever I was younger, I loved console games because it was a way to pass time without having to socialize. You know, you can swear at computer games and yeah. people just think you're angry, like at the game. But, so it was, a, it was an easy way to enjoy myself without too much threat. And I could focus as well. So a lot of the time I wouldn't even tick. So it, I loved games growing up. I used to play the Super Nintendo and the the PS1 and then um, my mom she we were really strapped for money when I was growing up but she once she like did that thing where you can pay in increments over like the course of a couple oh, of years yeah. and she got me like a PS2 and that was a great sense of escapism for me especially when I was very isolated mm. so yeah I loved gaming but I'd never really played with other people mm. so and were you good at it I'd like to think so, but I guess that's subjective. Sure, but I mean, as somebody that hadn't spent a lot of time socialising with people, I, I got Overwatch and a group of me and uh, this years ago when it came out, a group of me and me and a group of workmates all played it and I was rubbish at it <laughs> and so online just got a ton of abuse for how bad it was at it. So I guess you sort of, if you're someone that isn't used to talking in groups and you go into playing on the online community, you must have to be quite good, otherwise people are just going to slam you for being too rubbish to play with them honestly i don't remember oh. because i got accused of being a soundboard too often sure okay so i was pretty drunk a lot of my because <laughs> you were playing that drinking game yeah so i have no idea whether we're good um but i know that i got into competitive gaming since so i do like first person shooters i've been in a lot of apex tournaments and one prize money from those and like actually done all right so I, I'd like to think that I'm okay at it yeah well you're being very humble if you're winning prize money I'm sure you <laughs> must be really good at it so then uh you moved on to Twitch and again would you mind just explaining for anyone who's unfamiliar what is Twitch so Twitch is an online live streaming platform. It's kind of like watching television, but it's all happening in the moment. So people have channels and they're dedicated to their own content. So anyone can start a Twitch channel. You can just hop on, make your account, turn on your camera and stream to the masses. Mm. And it's not likely that you'll get more than one viewer at first. And some people grind at it and they stream for hours every day to like one or two viewers for years and years, hoping to make it big. But I didn't know that people could make it big. I didn't do any research. I didn't look up any streamers. I literally found out about it because I was playing Overwatch, a guy came over um, into my game and I just got chatting with him. He didn't like tomatoes and uh, I was like, how could you not like tomatoes? And we were just talking and his viewers thought I was either a soundboard, a voice actor or a streamer. They're like, she's got to be one of these three things. So they were Googling me and they couldn't find me because I wasn't any of those things. Mm. Um, and basically 
He said, I've got a confession I'm streaming. I was like, that's all right. I don't even know what that is. Um, and he gave me a link. I saw his chat and I was like, well, if I'm passively doing what it takes to be one of these three things, why don't I give it a go? So I made an account and yeah, I just used it to hang out with my friends because I got chatty and most of the gamers in Overwatch were dudes. So mm -hmm. if they hear a woman's voice and then they figure out it's not a soundboard at some point, they will f drop your friend request. So I ended up with more than 200 friends. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, whenever I went online, that was like 50, 60, 70 messages. Hey, 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 hey. Mm -hmm. And I only have like six slots. Mm. So I was like, I'm not going to spend two hours getting back to everyone. <laughs> I'm just going to stream it. And I'll be like, eh, I'm streaming now. And then people could see if I had like a full team or whatever. And that worked really great for me. Mm. Um, so immediately, as soon as I started, I had like 20 average viewers, mm. which is 20 at any given time. And over 100 like viewers that in total that had come to the stream. So I was like, this is doing really well. Usually people have to work really hard for this. Um so I kept on doing that. Then people paid a lot of attention to my condition because all of these friends had no idea I had Tourette's. Mm. They're not hearing the ticks. And suddenly on the live stream, I have no, there's no push to talk on the live right. stream. Yeah. So they're hearing all the extras. And they're like, what is happening? And I started having to explain Tourette's syndrome. And at this point, actually, it was just after I finally got my diagnosis. Ah, okay. At what age was this, sorry? Uh, about 27. So, Okay, so quite late. Yeah, because um, what happened was I got some tests in my early 20s, then had to leave town and um, because of everything that happened with my ex. And yeah. then um, they were supposed to message me and tell me the results, but they never did. And I never chased it up because my life was just thrown into turmoil. Mm. So um, I got in contact with them and was like, hey, I, we were investigating whether I had Tourette's syndrome. Could we look into that again? Because I never got any answers and I, I, really, I can't get a job. It's really getting in the way of my life. I need help. Mm. And they were like, oh, we diagnosed you like nearly 10 years ago. I was like, what? I was like, yeah, I looked through your records. You have Tourette's syndrome. We've known for quite a while. I was like, oh, oh my God. If you'd have told me back then. Yeah, like, helpful. This would have, yeah, this would have been life-changing. So you were diagnosed at 17, but you only found out at 27, is well, that right? Well, it said like nearly 10 years ago. Right. It was like sometime in my early 20s. Like it was either 20, 21, 23, Ooh, somewhere around there. Um, and so I finally had it and I, I got my medical records printed out and I was like, there it is. Right. And it was so liberating because I was like, no amount of therapy could have stopped me from all those slaps and mm. willy whops. Cause I used to whop people and just all sorts of terrible things. And I was like, I felt so guilty. I was like, why am I such a terrible person? But when I found out that it was Tourette's and for sure, I was like, this isn't something that I could help. It wasn't something I could choose not to do. Um, and I just felt this release and I got mm. to be able to diffuse situations because people were like, oh my God, what are you doing? And I'm like, I have Tourette's, I'm really sorry. And immediately people are nice. Like I was in the quiet train because there were no other seats um, on it and once. And this lady came over to me and went, excuse me, is that your phone? And um, I was like, no, I, I have, it's a tick. I'm doing it and I, I can't stop. Is it bothering you? I'm really sorry. And she went, I am so sorry. And she went from like Karen mode mm. to like, <laughs> and the whole train went silent, was just watching and smirking. Um, and do people know what Tourette's is, do you think, in general? The most, is it, is it in public sort of consciousness now as a condition? Nowadays, I'd like to think so, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say millions upon millions more people now know than mm. ever. Um, and... I think that wasn't the case when I was young at all. I mean, even I had vaguely heard of Tourette's syndrome as a child and decided I didn't have it because like, yes, I have these random things that I say, but like my idea of Tourette's syndrome didn't fit what I was experiencing. Mm. Everyone has a stereotype of Tourette's syndrome. Mm -hmm. They all think it's swear words, sudden, non-complex, just you shout fuck every now and again. But like I would sit there and I'd have these long complex ticks or I'd have motions that I'd do over and over again and things like that. And I was like, nah, it's like Tourette's, but it's not. Um, and so I think it's much more well known and much more well understood by the public now, uh, which is fantastic because it's infinitely safer to leave my house. I've been kicked off buses and in places, I've traveled to places even now where people don't understand Tourette's very much, like America, okay. and like lost thousands in plane tickets because of the chaos it's caused. Um, oh wow, even somewhere like uh, America or, or an airline or something like that, they don't, they don't have an awareness of what it might be. No. Wow. 
Well, yeah. so you've been kicked off the planes or you just haven't been allowed to board or? Well, they don't kick you off mid-flight, but they do, um, yeah, they will deny you entry if you're being abusive or causing a scene. Um, I do ask for special assistance and there is a whole process for that. They, but their special assistance is reserved for people with disabilities that are very visible. Mm. So they'll will walk up to and go, ah, you're this person here for special assistance, right? And I'll go, yep. And they'll go, I've got this wheelchair for you. Let's go. And I'm like, I don't need a wheelchair. And they're like, well, I don't know anything about that. Good luck. And I'm mm. like, Oh, fuck, because now I've got to go through all these cues without spanking anyone or yeeting oh, someone's God, baby. Yeah, and, <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't know what to do. So, like, in these situations, it can be really, really challenging. Um, and it's it causes chaos every... I've got a terrible ta- travel story for every time I've sure. the house. Have you ever yeeted a baby? <laughs> Not yet, but, okay, like, there's well, still plenty good. of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so now, now we've got... Um, We've got the um, we've got the sort of Twitch started up, and you're 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 doing that, and that's going quite well, and mm-hmm. it's growing. At what point did that become a thing that you thought, oh, this is actually a thing? This isn't a hobby. When I would have to pay to go to work, so I was making not that much money, but it was enough for me to be very comfortable and happy because, like, I'd grown up really poor, so like I was making like. 1800 a month Mm -hmm. which was more than I needed and I was like if I go to work today I'll make three four times less Mm. than if I just stay home order in some junk food and play computer games for three hours wow yeah and I was like who in their right mind would go to work today Mm. so I closed my shop for a week thinking I've gone viral because of my Tourette's. People will get bored of me shouting cock eventually, and then I'll have to go back to work. But for now, free holiday, paid holiday, let's Mm. go. Um, And then nobody left, and I'm still here four years later. (laughs) Um, So, And now people pay me even more to play computer games Mm. because it's not just that people can... Because on Twitch, people can donate. So people can subscribe for like £5 a month Mm -hmm. um, to support you and keep you streaming. There are tiers to subs, so you can have tier two, tier three, which is more money they're giving you. Then there's bits, which are basically currency, like in Twitch, that equates to money. They pay you real money, but based on how many bits people give you. And then there's actual PayPal donations, direct PayPal donations. And there's infrastructure set up so that, you know, people are chatting live. Next, mm. You know, you see chat scrolling by, but people can also pay for their message to be read out to you and the audience Mm -hmm. and things like this. So you're engaging with people and, you know, you're getting paid. And you can see at the end of the month how much a month you're going to get paid because of all of these subscriptions. And then on top of that, you can get sponsorships. If Mm -hmm. you are successful enough, the companies who run these games start to notice you and go, will you play my game too? (laughs) Um, Because we really like it to be popular. And um, so you end up being offered, like someone's just like, have a few grand, play my game for a few hours. Mm. And you're like, I would have paid to play this game. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) And is it that simple? It's just play it for a few hours. You don't need to say you like it or do you 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 have to say you like it? Is it just as simple as play this game and we'll give you some money? It depends on the contract. Sure. Um, But if they say you can't say you don't like it, I'm like, I have Tourette's. You're basically, that sentence is just guaranteed that I will say I don't like it. Mm. I once had a contract like that, I think, and it really put the anxiety up me. Sure. And I don't know which sponsorship it was, but immediately as soon as I started playing the game, I just went, this game is shit. (laughs) Okay. And like all of the chat was like, yep, 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 yep. Just agreeing. I was like, well, goodbye. They still paid me. They still paid me. I I was surprised. The, The check came in. I was like. Really? Do it um, again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and so what, at what point was it from when you first turned on your first ever Twitch stream mm-hmm. to closing that shop, the process that you just described? How long was that? Uh, so because I have anxiety and I'm not very secure in my connections because of my childhood and stuff, I think I was probably fine to completely close up my office um, within like two or three months. Wow. I didn't. I kept it there waiting for me to go back to work for like a good year and kept oh, wow. renting the office. Just as a plan B. Yeah, because I was just like, any minute now, they'll be bored of me. Any any minute, any minute now. And they just never left. So I just had that anxiety for so long that I 
kept it all mm. on standby for mm. that long. And there were so many repeat buyers because I was selling stuff you couldn't really find much anywhere. Mm. And so there were lots of buyers who were like, hello, are you going to come back? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have that still as plan B because it's re- what I ha- did for a living was really fun. Basically, I would go out to the beach every morning at mm. sunrise, pick up sea glass, hang out with all the wildlife, give the crows some peanuts and stuff, make all my animal friends happy, come back, wash it all, sort it out, I'll watch Netflix while I get them all packaged up and everything. So beach walk, Netflix, message a few people, take some stuff to the post office, and then just sort any like craft supplies into little bags ready to be posted instantly and stuff. That does sound really nice. Yeah, just I would rock up in my pajamas every day, swear at my PC, not bother anyone. It was great. So, yeah, you know, I'm I'm fine. Like, it, the thing is, like, I've been doing Twitch in a really relaxed way, kind mm. of. I mean, it eats all my time. It's what I do 24-7 because I'm really passionate about it. But, like, I'm not doing it for, like, a huge career. Otherwise, I'd probably be slightly less opinionated. Um, so I, I, I get to not take it too seriously, mm-hmm. which has kept me going. Because when you've seen someone say, get your tits out for the 6,000th time, it can get a bit wearing. But if you're not taking it too seriously and you know there are really no consequences if you fuck up your career tomorrow, it, it makes being a content creator much easier. Um, and I like talking because talking helps with the tics because I have really bad dyslexia and communication issues. Um, parts of my brain are really underactive and um, it's a struggle to speak. So it takes a lot of focus. Well, that, and that, that's an interesting point because you talked earlier about when you did the gaming degree about the guys you were with, you weren't very keen on. And then what you just said there about the comments you get on Twitch sometimes. What's the dark side of becoming famous on the internet? <laughs> um, how long have you got? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not what people think it is at all. In a good way or a bad way? Both. Okay. Both. Yeah, the dark side of fame, I could tell you so many stories. I mean, between the stalkers, the sexual harassment, the weird security messages that you have Mm. to take, um, how it alienates you from your friends and how people treat you differently in a way that makes it really difficult and hollow to connect with people. Mm. Um, So on an emotional level, it changes everything. On a social level, it changes everything. Financial, um, it changes everything. Uh, Do you think being a, a woman has a lot to do with it as well? Oh, yeah, but it's as with many jobs, Mm. there's like dude mode and hard mode. Mm. So like I get I get hard mode as a woman on on Twitch. Um, There will be things that no man will ever face on Mm. Twitch, um, but women will get all the time. And there's a stereotype that all you have to be is pretty on Twitch and people will shower you with money and you'll always get instant success. But I've seen that less than 1% of the less than one percent of streamers make more than a thousand pounds per year from twitch streaming oh it's wow statistically virtually impossible to succeed as a streamer i had no idea that was a stat that's uh, crazy yeah. and then uh the top 300 there's like two or three women <laughs> so like the most the top 300 most successful streamers are mostly men and there's just a different criteria for men than there is women mm-hmm. so a disqualifying criteria for me is i'm not allowed to have sex because if I have a boyfriend or a partner, um, people will unsubscribe and stop watching. Mm. And it's people think it's because when viewers watch a woman, it's just because they fancy her. That women don't have any real content and that the only thing they have of value to the gaming community is just boobs. But the thing with that is, is that's not actually what's happening. I genuinely think that what's happening is that because... The gaming community is mostly male. Mm. This isn't because men are better at computer games. It's because when computer games were first marketed, they were only marketed as a boy's toy. So people were buying them for Christmas when they first came out for their boys. Mm -hmm. So young girls didn't really have much incentive and much of an introduction to gaming 30 years ago. Mm. And so it became a boys club just by virtue of marketing. People just assumed girls wouldn't like them, which was wrong. But it meant that there's this huge community of boys um, who were socially inept, doing hi- you know hiding from reality in games, and so they didn't learn a lot of social skills because they were isolated. Like me, I had low social skills. Games were a refuge for me too. It's not a criticism, but what it means is that when it becomes a social club and people are starting to play together, you're mostly going to find men mm. with low social skills 
who kind of resent women for not fucking them. And then, you know, you enter that space and they're all aggressive towards you, constantly insulting and rejecting you. They don't cooperate with you. If you do call outs in the game, like there's a shooter over there or whatever, they're not going to listen to you. So it's harder to learn how to cooperate. It's harder to learn those team skills because there's a 50 to 90% chance no one's really going to listen to you or mm. help you as a woman. So when you jump into that environment to test the waters, that's a lot different to trying Mario 30 years ago to test the waters. Mm -hmm. Most girls are turned off these games now. So there's a barrier to entry and only women with a certain character type will get in. And even then it will take perseverance. And, you know, that, that means there's this bottleneck where it's mostly dudes and they're mostly straight, socially inept dudes. When you're Twitch streaming to a gaming community, which Twitch is largely gaming, um, what happens is um, these guys will listen to you for whatever content you're making, but not many men growing up are taught how to differentiate between admiring a woman and wanting to possess her. We don't really let men take on feminine interests. So like men as young boys can't dress up as their favorite female characters from mm. things because they'd be ridiculed. They'd be accused of being gay. They'd be, you know, insulted. It was considered demeaning for a man to behave feminine. So boys aren't taught how to look up to women, how to look across at women, how to hang out with women. The narratives they're told are you just earn them for doing cool shit, mm. like save the world, earn the girl. Mm. Um, there aren't very many narratives where boys and girls are friends, where it isn't just like a slow romance, where she may make noises, where she has a choice and stuff, but really he'll earn her in the end because he's done all the good shit. Like that's the narrative boys grow up, boys grow up with. So a lot of these socially inept boys who weren't raised among girls learn that if they like something a girl, it must mean they fancy them. It's a really common mistake. And I know I'm generalizing here um, that a lot of, you know, most men in normal society are capable of relating to women. But in this insular gaming society full of Redditors and 4chan and just all this stuff, like this is a very common mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and you face it a lot on Twitch. And this means that if you are gaming and producing perfectly good content, people will become infatuated with you because they just, they go, I admire you. That must mean I fancy you. Mm. I can't imagine relating to a girl for any other reason. Um, and so if you have a partner, your views will drop because, not because they ever thought they had a chance with you, not because they thought their subscription was going to buy them a blowjob. It's literally because they're jealous. It makes mm. them uncomfortable. They're suddenly comparing themselves to somebody else. And so your content went from being fun to making them uncomfortable because they're like, well, I'm cool too. And you'd have probably rejected me because you're a bitch. And he probably has a bigger dick than me. And I don't like this anymore. Ah, and I feel feelings that are uncomfy. And so people are just uncomfortable around women who aren't sexually available, even if they never plan to have sex with them, just because of a, re a relatability barrier mm. that have, has been cultivated. Have you ever seen that Reddit sub, uh, Nice Guys? Yes. That, that was my first sort of exposure to how prevalent that is, where mm -hmm. for anyone listening or watching that doesn't know, uh, this sub is basically just people posting, well, mostly women, unfortunately, posting interactions with uh, guys on the internet where the sort of template for an interaction is, hey, how are you? Hey, I'm fine, how are you? Good, do you want to get a drink sometime? Oh, sorry, I've got a boyfriend. Fuck you, whore. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. It, not even, it's, it, but, but like the amount of those kind of posts. And it's like, I, that feels quite, the first time I saw that, I was kind of like, oh my God, because it's just thousands of posts a day of people saying the same thing, that that's how the interactions go. And to hear you explain it like that actually is, is really good. It's a very, um, it's a very clear way of explaining where that process has all come from and the kind of lack of social skills and, as you describe, uncomfy feelings. And is that something you deal with? Like, do you think with Twitch, there's also an odd thing about the fact that people are giving money? Do you think that they feel that gives them some kind of ownership or that you owe them something for the money? I'm learning not at all, unless I'm just full of very submissive viewers because I right. happily okay. roast them and sass back and I will not act really grateful for money that comes with an insult. Um, and people really enjoy that. Like you, if you're honest to a fault, people crave that on Twitch. Because but do, Twitch do you get like big donation? Do you know, do you ever get those kind of things where it's like a big donation with then an immediate sort of follow up about you or do you want to meet or do you want to hang out or i think i'm way too well known okay, to fine, for that to happen right. i have people give me a uh, huge sums of money with no expectations here's right. two grand buy yourself a new pc you're wow. lagging like this sort of stuff um 
that's happened since the beginning. Um, some some viewers have felt entitled to meetups and things like this. And I learned very early on, I made a perilous mistake when I was like a 20 viewer Andy, um, where this guy was like, hey, I'm in like Devon, do you want to meet? And I was like, not in my town. I don't want anyone to know where my town is. And he was like, okay, maybe in an adjacent town or something. I was like, fine. I, you know, you give me so much of your time watching my show, like, why not? And so I met up with him and he was really weird. Um, I said, I can only meet up with you for an hour. I've got to care for my mom. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. As soon as I'd set off, he was like, I hope you're going to make it worth my while. I hope you're not going to waste my time. I have traveled a long way. I hope you're not just going to shoot straight after an hour. I was like, that's what we agreed on. And it was mm. already getting weird. And um, then I paid for the food. We sat, ate a meal, had a conversation and uh, I paid for the food. He's like, I've never had a date buy the food. I was like, this was never a date. What, what are you on about? And he was like, uh, you'll see. I was like, no, I really won't. And then he, he, I went to the train station a little early because I was already fed up with this. Mm. And um, he was like, before you go, can you come back to my car? I want to give you a gift. And I followed him to the car park at a distance. Mm. He got to the car and he was like, come closer. It's all right. And I was like, uh. so I stayed like, out of arm's reach and he'd lost his keys and he was like wait right there I just need to get my keys I had such a terrible feeling about this so I went to the train station while he was gone he came back and was like you've got to come back I'm having a, a hyperglycemic attack I'm diabetic I'm dying and I was like why are you texting me instead of calling an ambulance mm. and I was on the train and I, I, was, I was like I'm sorry good luck I'm already on the train and um, he was absolutely fine and we ended up banning him from my discord community because he was saying Obsession is natural. Rape is natural. It's the natural oh order of God. things. You can't tell me a single society where women dominated. You just can't. It's men's natural place, all this sort of stuff. So I left the VC and was like, he's a bit of a creep. And he said, come back here, you stupid little bitch, in like DMs. Just like, get back in the VC now, you coward, and all this sort of stuff. I was like, I'm burning this guy. God. I'm really glad he didn't find his keys. Um, and from there, I learned that nobody's entitled to my time just because they watch. And I'm glad I learned that really early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's quite a terrifying story, isn't it? Because just as you've described it, there's a lot of ways where that could have gone much, much worse. And the thought that people with just 20 uh, viewers or whatever, 20 subscribers, could be attracting this kind of personality who will then travel to meet them in person and mm -hmm. have slightly odd motivations is worrying. And oh, it gets worse. I had a guy camping in my back garden who assaulted me and then... Um, the police caught him on his, uh, his way to my house with a knife. He'd constantly threatened to kill me while I was live on stream. He's like, I know where you live and I'm coming over to kill you and all this sort of stuff. And he wasn't dealt with for a long time. Um, so, yeah, things can get very, very serious very fast. Um, and do you think that's something, do you think you've been, for want of a better word, unlucky? Or do you think that's when you talk to other female streamers, is it experiences that they've ex had as well? This is the industry standard for females on Twitch. Oh, God. So basically what I'd say is if you're a woman who's new to Twitch, I'd say only join if you don't have any social media. If you have any social media with your full name, maybe don't bother. If you are planning to stream, delete all that before you start. Second, um, never tell anyone your real name. Never talk about your hometown. Disguise your room. It has to be a blank wall. Any defining feature, a window, a beam, a banister, anything, people will look through thousands upon thousands of housing listings to find that one house with that detail from when it was listed in like whenever, whatever year, it doesn't matter how far back it was. And they will find your exact address and post it all over the internet and encourage each other to attack you, stalk you and this sort of thing, and no distance will be too far. I had someone fly from the Netherlands. I've had someone fly from America. I've had a few people fly from America to harass me. So don't just think, oh, I live in a remote place. This won't happen to me. Fly over because they think if they come over, you and them will be able to be in a relationship or just because they want to upset you or harass you or hurt you? Mixture of both. I mean, most stalkers' mentality, I could write books and books on stalkers and mm. the psychology of it, you get different kinds. Mm. But the, a very common one for women is specifically the, 
I'm in love with you. We're meant for each other. You just don't know it yet. Mm. You're my soulmate. And if I could just get you to talk to me for five minutes, you'll understand. What do I have to do to get you to talk to me for five minutes? Mm. Oh, if I insult you, you'll ban me? That means you read my message. I'll make a new account. What can I say this time? She reacted again. One day she'll react enough and she'll she'll see. And so um, they'll make account after account after account. Doesn't matter how many times you block them. They'll start like trying to look up your friends and family social media, they'll pretend to have no idea who you are and they'll make friends with them and they'll, you know, just make casual conversation and try to learn little tidbits about you passively. Um, maybe they'll start hanging out with your siblings or a relative and start going to their home in the hopes that one day you'll come over at the same time. Um, they'll do things like this constantly, anything, anything to get five minutes with you because then you'll see. And so it doesn't matter how extreme the behavior becomes, if it gets a reaction out of you, they're making progress. And so they could be threatening to kill you, but they think at one point it will mean that you'll love them. And so it's not like traveling over to get you to marry them. It's traveling over because I've just got to talk just to get, you. The tragedy of this conversation is, you know, where we started was somebody that had no way of interacting with society and wanted to know how and then found a way that they could interact with society comfortably. And then it turns out society's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think for me, I had seen a lot more of the dark side of humanity and only the dark side of humanity growing up. I mean, I saw my mom have a terrible chronic illness that wasn't diagnosed for 20 years just because they just didn't believe her. Mm. That's a really common thing. Um, and then when she was finally diagnosed, it was too late to operate on. So her life is ruined. Mm. Um, and so I saw the dark side of the medical uh, community and how that's very incredibly sexist. But then I also saw... Um, like the lady with the meat cleaver abusing mm. animals mm. Um, who turned me vegan for life. <laughs> um, and then I saw these terrible men who simultaneously said, I love you, but we're trying to kill you or beat you. Um, I also had the boys who wouldn't respect my boundaries until I beat some sense into them. And the boys that beat me unconscious. And I saw a lot of violence. I saw a lot of horrible behavior and not a lot of good. So I feel like I got more of a glimpse of the good side of humanity now than ever because a lot of Twitch is people who want to give someone their time, want to listen to what other people have to say, want to give, want to support, and that's the majority of Twitch. Twitch wouldn't operate if it wasn't by mm. majority those people. Mm. And so it's very easy to pay attention to the dark side because we're primates and if we ignore good things, they run silently in background. If we ignore bad things, they could kill us. Mm -hmm. And so evolutionarily speaking, it's so easy to see a thousand comments saying, you're beautiful, I love you, sweet Anita, you're so funny. And then see one comment that says you have a big nose and you'll remember that for the rest of the day. So <laughs> um, I feel like now, because I'm very well practiced in looking at the good and appreciating it, I, I feel fine with knowing about the bad. And I'm actually really glad that the bad people come to my stream specifically because I run, I run alongside a charity that provides um, mental health care and helps pro um, support financially people who can't afford it and things like this. So I have a link my community can make link use of and it's a really passive roast when someone comes and acts up and is like sexually harassing you and stuff and you're like, if you're feeling lonely and a bit desperate for attention, we do have ways to help you get therapy, you know? And people smirk because they're like, this is wholesome but also kind of insulting. Um, and I have like all of these talks with my viewers about how to handle these people, how to handle negativity, how to handle the negativity in yourself. And I think a lot of the people that are really prominent in my community, because I have a Discord server aside with thousands and thousands of people, I think it's like got 40,000 people in, and they all support each other and they're a great social network, but they, a lot of them used to be really toxic. A lot of them used to be assholes. And um, I get a lot of DMs from people who were like, I was a terrible person until I found your stream and now mm. I've found all these people and I've learned some social skills and I'm here in this community. My community meet up with each other. They're marrying each other, you know. I'm hoping there'll be some little sweet Indian fan base <laughs> babies happening soon, you know. It's really cute. So I'm glad these toxic people find me because when they go and rant and rave in other streams, they're not going to get the infrastructure to actually have some real attention and that was what it was about. Like, people don't come and be inflammatory for no reason. It's because 
they don't know how to believe that the good side of them will ever be appreciated. They don't mm. think that if they're just themselves, anyone will like them and, you know, socialize with them. So they act up to get a reaction because it's less lonely when someone's reacting to you. It doesn't mm. matter why. Um, so when trolls come into my stream, I've got a viewer base that can identify what's happening and make friends with them, calm them down a little bit. And uh, yeah, like a few months later, they're coming to TwitchCon and drinking with them all and Amazing. just being happy. And um, It's really uh, impressive what you're saying there about trying to fix the trolls because ultimately the easy thing to do is to tell them to fuck off or whatever and then like you well, say... Well, I do that too, well, not sure. voluntarily. <laughs> no, but nothing ever changes. But the, like, it's interesting there because we've heard the, the good side of it for you, the, the positive impact it's had on your life uh, as well as some of the negatives. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Like, What's the next five years? Are you kind of living each day, each week, each year as it comes or do you have plans? Okay, so part I, I mentioned earlier my brain doesn't... Like, I struggle with certain concepts. Mm -hmm. I have no concept of time. Okay. You see, see you in an hour. I don't. That's like a map to a place, and I don't know where that place is. I just can't find it on the map. Like, an hour could be twenty minutes. It could be three days to me. I just can't gauge it very well. Wow. And this means that I'm not planning anything. Mm. And since I stopped planning, my life's gotten so much better because when I try to plan with that level of disability, none of those plans go well. I guess like I got I got sort of two more questions before we're done. Like the first one is. Um, do you feel like Tourette's defines you or do you feel like it's part of you? You know, when you meet someone with for the first time, <laughs> do you feel that you should say, by the way, I have Tourette's or is that something that slipped into the background in more recent life? Because when I first started seeing your videos, it was very much like uh, the Tourette's were always in the title of mm -hmm. the videos I'd seen, whether it was other people posting them or whatever. Whereas now that doesn't seem to be as big a thing. It seems to be more just a gaming thing. Okay. Um, firstly, I'll say, no, I'm not my Tourette's at all. My Tourette's has nothing to do with my identity. It's just a condition I manage. That's like saying someone is their eczema. Mm. Like, I don't choose what I handle in life. I am what I choose about myself. So I didn't choose to have Tourette's. That's not me. How I handle my Tourette's is an aspect of my identity. But, like, what I'm facing is just not me. Like, you wouldn't say someone was their trauma. You wouldn't mm -hmm. say someone was their hair color. The things we choose about ourselves are the things we are. And so, and when I first started making content, I found it so important to put with Tourette's in every title of everything, all the streams, all the YouTube videos, because, not because I was like, look at me, guys, I had Tourette's. It was more, if I don't explain why I'm swearing, I will get demonetized. If I don't explain this as a condition, people will rant and rave at me in the comments. If I'm engaging with someone on my stream and it looks like I'm sexually harassing them or swearing at them, people will get mad at me and hate me. They have to understand this is involuntary. And if it's right there in the title, if you don't want to hear f swearing, it's on you if you clicked on it anyway. Mm. Whereas like people would come in and they'd be like, what if children see this? You're getting, like I was getting accused when I first arrived. They're like, you don't belong here. This is live streaming. Like if you can't not swear and not breach the terms of service of Twitch and not break the rules, you shouldn't be here. Because mm. the rules say you can't say the N words. You can't say like racial slurs and things like this, which is fair and totally fine. But I can't help it. So it just exclude people with disabilities if you enforce it when people don't mean it and they're just, you know. So I, in that situation, making people aware that I had Tourette's syndrome was essential to my presence. It wasn't like uh, a way to grab an audience. It wasn't a aspect of my identity. It was just a coping strategy for a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I've become more well-known, people already know that I have my condition. I mean, when I hung out with the Sidemen on YouTube, that video I was on was had 38 million views. So just by that one video alone, there'll be like millions of people who now know that I am the Tourette's girl, <laughs> which means that if I just put my own name in the content or my own face in the thumbnail, most people know what to expect now, so I can chill a bit because people already know what to expect. Mm. And that's what the transformation was. Um, because for me, I feel like a lot of people who regularly come to my streams ask me questions that have nothing to do with my condition. You can tell a newcomer because they're asking the same questions over mm -hmm. and over again about my condition, but a lot of people stay for the other discussions, mm -hmm. luckily, because you know that's what I'm passionate about. 
and I'm much calmer and I tick less when I talk. So I just want to engage as myself, not just constantly be exhausted and can't have people fixate on my condition because ticking is exhausting. Um, so yeah, that's the overview of why that changed and how I feel about my condition. I think like you, you've got an amazing skill of really being able to explain situations in a way that make it very accessible and easy to understand for people who haven't been in those situations before. So even in Thank this you. chat, there's, you know, obviously there's a Tourette's thing, but being a female streamer, how Twitch works, like the interactions with different people, it's really fascinating to you to listen to you. And I, we could go on and on, except I've got my director messaging me <laughs> on the iPad saying, wrap it up, wrap it up. So um, I just wanted to say, you know, best of luck with the future and thanks so much for coming back. And um, Fuck off. your video, I said this before, but your video was when we put it up on our channel, it was the fastest we've ever hit a million views. <laughs> so Amazing. fingers crossed for this one. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. So that was Sweet Anita, the Twitch streamer. Uh, I'm joined now by Josh, the director of the episode. Um, pretty fun. Brilliant. We were all cracking up in the back. <laughs> She's such a great talker, such, isn't she? Such a great talker. Yeah. So just, yeah, really succinct. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's layered with some horrific stories mm. that she's gone through so much and she's come through it. Uh, what did you think, Bryony? I want her to be my friend. Yeah, I yeah, want to yeah. hang out with her and go for a drink with her. Um, and with such wit, she told what has actually been a really difficult life story. Yes. Traumatic, yeah. But with such poise. And she also, you know, as a female listening to that, she touched on a lot of topics that as a female you can relate to you don't want to relate to but is part and parcel when she's experienced that you know the really hard end of that being a twitch streamer and being at the forefront of you know thousands and thousands of men watching her online mm. dude mode or hard mode yeah. that's what she said wasn't it yeah i felt that online game was quite a good sort of summary of it because that really important thing at the start where she could press a button and not be mm. heard mm -hmm. or press a button to talk and so for the first time she said I wasn't defined by my Tourette's mm. when she was meeting people. And then the dark side of it in terms of the well, the people who would camp out in her garden, follow her, abuse her, like it's just awful. Mm. And then again, she's like made a career out of it, which she loves and she's in control of. So, um, But yeah, there's, there's there's a lot more to talk about with her. And, and, and it's interesting because you start, the bit that you start talking about is naturally Tourette's. <clears throat> but by the end, that just seems yeah, to have taken a back on. seat. Yeah, mm. and the whistling is really nice. Oh yeah, the whistling. I was mesmerising the whistling. Yeah. It was. <laughs> you you lost your trail of thought. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of adjustment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's, little... she's got something in her that I want. Mm -hmm. Some some level of resilience and just... she. You know when she said she's got four therapists and they all said, why are you not <laughs> mm -hmm. more fucked up? And then she went on to say, because I've experienced... You know, I've slept on the street and I know mm -hmm. I can do it so I could do it again. You know, when humans don't think they can dig any deeper, they can and she really epitomizes that mm. i think it's interesting to hear what she said as well because we talked to a few different youtubers and stuff like that and they're all talking about the next thing as in that you know the, the they're moving into a new area as well as youtube and a lot of them are very uh, clever entrepreneurs yeah. whereas her thing is so different it's just like the next five minutes the next, is what yeah. my focus is um and it'll be interesting to see what she does next i guess I get always asked this question, you know, you were a spy inside Al-Qaeda in the uh, months and the years bef before 9-11. Mm. How, could, how could you not have seen it coming? And I would say, well, we've seen it coming that something big is going to happen. But the details were so well guarded because the Al-Qaeda was uh, split into compartments. Mm. The people who were trained for that uh, in a mission were trained in a secret camp that was set up for them. And then they themselves, you know, at least 14 of them, 14 out of the 19, did not know that it was a suicide mission. They thought it was only uh, a hijacking. Wow. And that's it. Only five. 